the title of my sermon this morning is Jesus is the Only Way. Wow, this is going well. <laughs> I've only told you the title so far. Um, so the title is Jesus is the Only Way, and m- the point of my sermon this morning is that Jesus is the Only Way. So I'm just giving you the point right away. This is basic, basically a one-point sermon, if you, or at least a one-thing sermon that it's about. So Jesus is the Only Way is not only title, but it's the point of this morning's sermon. When I say Jesus is the Only Way, I'm saying Jesus is the Only Way to God, that Jesus is the Only Way to Heaven, that Jesus is the Only Way to escape judgment, to avoid hell to receive forgiveness of your sins and to be right with God. And I am aware that those statements are controversial in our culture. I understand that there are lots of people that believe that to believe that and to say that out loud in America of all places, that that's very mean and and narrow and exclusive to say that Jesus is the only way. But it is an important belief if, in fact, it is in the Bible. And it is. And I want to show it to you this morning. If you have your Bible, you can go to John chapter 14. If not, the words are going to come on the screen. Actually, they're coming on the screens no matter what you do. Um, (laughs) John 14, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read to you. And this is a conversation that Jesus is having with his um, disciples. It's the night before he gets killed. So this is one of the last conversations that he has with his disciples, and we're actually jumping into the middle of a conversation. He had already been talking with them about how he's going to leave them, how he's going to go, and some of the stuff Peter says in response almost makes me think that they underst- maybe Peter understood that the I'm going to go means I'm going to die, but I don't know if they fully understand what he's talking about, but he's already said I'm going to go once, and then he continues to talk, and so this is John 14, starting in verse 1. Jesus says to his followers, your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Which is interesting that he would say it that way. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. So interesting, Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples, and he starts talking about the fact that he's going to go away, and he talks about his father's house. Seems to be implying, I'm going to go away to my father's house, right? Which his father is God, and so he's talking about heaven of some sort, right? He's saying, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If that were not true, I would have told you that. But I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I'm I'm, I'm leaving you. And maybe you'll be a little worried when I leave, but I'm leaving to prepare a place for you. And my going is is going to prepare a place for you. And then, don't worry, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back for you, and then I'm going to take you to my father's house. I'm going to take you to the place that's been prepared for you. And then he ends with, you know the way to where I'm going. Now, it seems to me at least some of the disciples were, were going, we don't know fully what you're talking about. So we don't know the way to where you're going. One of the disciples speaks up at this point in verse 5. Now, his, he's, the, the, the character that talks next is famous in the Bible, but he's not famous for this verse. He's famous for something that happens later on. Um, one of the disciples' names is Thomas, And Thomas, after Jesus dies on the cross and after Jesus rises again, there's this time where Jesus appears to all of his disciples, except for Thomas. They're all there except for him. And then they go and tell Thomas, like, you'll never believe he's alive. We saw him dead and then we saw him alive again. But Thomas didn't believe that that was true. And ever since then, he earned the nickname Doubting Thomas, right? So that all took place about four days after what I'm about to read to you. So he's not Doubting Thomas yet. He's just regular old Thomas at this point. And Jesus says, you know the way to where I'm going. Verse 5, Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? We don't know for sure what you're talking about. You're going to go and there's places in your father's house and you're preparing a place. Then you're going to come back and take us to the place where you're going. But what is that? Where are you going? We don't know the way. And then Jesus responds, and this is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Jesus says this in John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And then he adds something in there that makes it really clear. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. So Thomas says, we don't, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, you do. You don't know that you know the way, but you do. You know me. And I'm the way. And then he makes it clear. I mean, you could cut. The fact that he says, I'm the way, you could imagine maybe that means he's the only way. But, but he makes it clear. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You do know the way to where I'm going, Thomas, because you know me. I am the way, and I'm the only way. Jesus is the one true Savior. That's what he claimed about himself. He's the one way to heaven. He's the one way to God. And this is not the only passage in the Bible that, that speaks like this. And so if someone were to come along and go, well, I don't know. I mean, that looks like what he said, but I mean, I don't know if that's how he meant it. He was trying to comfort his disciples, and, and I just, who knows what Jesus was really thinking about at that moment. Maybe he didn't, you know, didn't mean it the way it sounded. But this is not the only place in the Bible that sounds like this. The disciples seem to take him literally. Uh, Peter and John, this is a few pages later in the Bible, Acts chapter 4, verse 11, Peter and John are speaking to the Sanhedrin. This would be a group of people who were very anti-Jesus at this point. And they, Peter and John say, this Jesus, this is Acts 4, 11, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. That's a reference to the Old Testament, a quote from the Old Testament. And then they say this, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. If you want to be saved, there's just one name. Salvation is found in no one else. That's what they said. Paul said something similar. He seemed to, take, he seemed to have the same understanding. He was writing a letter one time, the Apostle Paul. He wrote a letter to his friend Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, this what I'm reading is just an excerpt of a letter that he wrote. And he says to Timothy this. He says, this is good. And it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now look at the next verse. He says, for there is... How many gods? One God. There's one God. So not there's one God for every country, not there's one God for every religion. There's one God total. And not only is there just one God, there's one mediator between God and man. Mediator is a middleman, a go-between, someone who connects two different groups, right? How in the world is humanity to be connected to God? There is not only just one God, but there's one go-between that connects God and man. Who is this? A man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. So we see this in multiple places in the Bible, and I wanted you to know, I wanted you to know this is in the Bible multiple times. I wanted you to know that Jesus himself said it about himself. And then I wanted to now address a couple of objections that I hear from people. Because we might say, okay, this is what the Bible says, but I'm sure there are plenty of people that go, yeah, well, who cares? The Bible says that. It can't be true. That can't be right. And here's, here's my objection. And I just want to cover two objections that I have heard to the idea that Jesus is the only way. I want to address them real kind of quickly and then explain this from hopefully a different angle than you've heard before. So two objections. One objection, and you've probably heard this too, one objection that you hear from people is, I don't believe this because my aunt doesn't believe in Jesus. Okay? One of the things that you hear is when someone says Jesus is the only way, Someone will go, well, that can't be true because my dad is not a Christian. It can't be true that Jesus is the only way because my best friend is an atheist, however they phrase it, but my blank doesn't meet those qualifications. My, my mom doesn't believe in Jesus, so I don't believe it. Now, that's understandable. I think it's totally understandable to feel that way. I think it, it, it feels right to us to react to, to this truth in this way. And yet there's a problem with it, if you think it through, because the person that says, I don't believe this because my blank doesn't believe in Jesus, the person is essentially saying, I, I don't believe it because I don't like it. Right? It can't be true because I don't want it to be true. Which again is understandable, but you don't do that with almost any other thing in your life. There's almost, there are almost no other things that you go, I don't believe this because I don't like it. 
There are lots of things in life we don't like and we still believe they are true. I mean, I'll just as a tiny example, traffic tickets, okay? <laughs> Nobody likes them. Everyone knows they're real, right? And those of you, how many of you got, ever got a traffic ticket in your whole life? Can I see? Yeah, so you all know, right? Oh, isn't it awful? I don't know anyone that thinks they're good. I don't know anyone who likes them. I've never heard a story of anybody who looked at the police officer and said, thank you. <laughs> this is what I needed. My lead foot, I mean, I just, I really, I need to make some changes. And this is going to be the reminder that I needed. Thank you. Right? No. No one does that. We don't like it, but we believe it. I don't think anyone's ever looked at the police officer and said, this isn't real. Right? <laughs> No one denies it as true. No one goes home and sets it on the table and someone says, hey, what's that? And you go, I don't know, it says traffic ticket, but it must be a coupon because I don't, I don't want that to be true. We, we don't do that. Well, let's say, as another example, someone breaks up with you, okay? Those of you that are dating, you know that moment where they come and they say, it's, you know, it's not you, it's me, and let's just be friends. <laughs> Nobody likes that, right? Nobody likes that. So, I mean, if you're the one getting dumped, it's no fun to be dumped. But you believe it's happening when it's happening, right? Nobody looks at the person and says like, well, no, no, we're not, because I don't want this to happen. We're still together, right? Nobody does that. And if the person, if you, if you do dump someone and they keep saying, yeah, no, this can't be true, and they keep going to your house every weekend like you're still together, like that's not romantic, that's stalker, right? <laughs> And so you kind of understand this in lesser things, but in all arenas of life, it's not good for us to not believe things because we don't like them. And therefore, not believing that Jesus is the only way because my mom's not a Christian, that can't be the kind of reasoning that we use to determine what's true and false about God. There's another objection that I hear a lot. Maybe this one is just as much. Sometimes people will say, well, this... This can't be true because I believe in a God of love. And a God of love would not exclude all of these sincere, good people. You've heard that before? Yeah. I, it cannot be true that Jesus is the only way. I believe in a God of love, and he would not exclude all of these sincere people, meaning I have friends who are Hindus, I have friends who are Muslims, I have friends who are Buddhists, and they are very sincere in their faith. They're faithful in their religion. They believe what they believe. They believe it strongly. They're doing a good job of it. And I don't see how a God of love could exclude someone from their kingdom like that. So sincere. Or maybe they will say it more like this. I know some good people. I have my, I have my best friend is an atheist, and he is nicer and better than most of the Christians I know. Right? And by the way, if you're in that club, I'm in that club with you. I'm, I am quite sure there are atheists who are nicer and gooder than some of us. All right? I'm totally there with you. I believe that's a real thing. And they'll say, well, and no, go, no God would exclude this good person. And so there are two problems with this objection, though, and I want to point them out to you. The first problem with it is that God is love comes from the Bible. You see where I'm going with this? That when you say, I can't believe what the Bible says about Jesus being the only way because I believe God is love, okay, where do you get the idea that God is love? That's from the Bible. You, how can you take a concept from the Bible to use to invalidate what the Bible teaches? It's, it's like saying, I believe in the Bible so much that I don't believe in it, right? That if you get to the point where you go, Jesus is the only way, I realize he said no one comes to the Father by, by me, I understand there's salvation, no one else, and there is no other, na other name under heaven by which we can be saved. There is one God, there is one mediator. I don't believe any of that, so I reject it. Okay, but you reject it, why? Because God is love. Where do you get that from? remembering you rejected this. Where, where, how do you know God is love? Do the other religions all say God is love? If you're someone that's just walking through this world and you don't know anything from the Bible, would you just assume with all the suffering in the world, God is love? Like, where do we get the idea of believing God is love so strongly once we've set the Bible aside? Who says? Like, once you've set this aside, who says God's a God of love? Christians believe that God is love and that that does not contradict that Jesus is the only way. And in fact, sometimes those two concepts, Jesus being the only way and God being loving, are found in the same paragraph in the Bible. It's not like there's some verses that say God is love and some say Jesus is the only way and oh, how can we know? And they contradict. No, 
the authors of the Bible didn't think that there was a contradiction there. You'll see it all in the same paragraph. Let me show you John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Now, the first verse I'm about to read to you, John 3, 16, is the most famous verse in the Bible, but I'm going to read the whole paragraph that it's found in. John 3, 16 through 18 says, For God, what's the third word? Loved. For God loved the world in this way. Many translations say, For God so loved the world. For God loved the world in this way. So I just want to be clear, this, what I'm about to read to you, this is about God's love. This is a verse that assumes a loving God. God loved the world. What does that mean, the world? I think it means the people in the world. God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He's loving. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But, look at this, anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. So when John was recording Jesus' words here, it seems that he didn't see there was a contradiction. He thought that God is love and that anyone who rejects him is condemned. So God is love and Jesus is the only way are both ideas that we get from the Bible. The second problem with there can't just be one way because I believe in a God of love and he would not exclude sincere and good people. At least it seems to me, and I did not realize this at first, but then one day it dawned on me. Those people who are saying there can't just be one way because actually believe in one way. Think about this. If somebody says there cannot be just one way because God would not exclude sincere people, isn't that saying sincerity is the way to God, right? So there is one way. We like you say, well, there can't be one way. There's got to be all these ways. But, but what do the, all the ways have in common? Well, these people are so sincere in their faith. Well, then you believe in one way. You believe that there's one way to God, and that way is sincerity. And that is exclusive because you're excluding insincere people. Or you might use a different word. Some people don't say sincere. Some people say good. They go, God would not exclude these good people. Okay, but just realize you believe there's one way to God. Goodness is the, the way you believe you get to God. The way you get to heaven is goodness. And that is an exclusive belief, right? Because you're excluding bad people. So lots of people believe in one way to God. And Jesus agrees with that. <laughs> he just thinks it's him. And I realize that seems mean and narrow. And what I, so what I want to do is for the rest of this sermon, I would like to try to explain this to you, something that maybe many of you have heard before, but I'd like to explain it to you from a different angle than you're used to hearing it. I actually heard this years ago, the, the kind of the, the idea that I want to flesh out this morning. I heard this idea years ago from a pastor named Erwin McManus. I was, this was like 10 or 12 years ago. I was listening to this podcast, and they did a question and answer session with him. And one of the questions they asked him was something like, is Jesus the only way, or is Jesus the one way of salvation? Something like that. And he said, and his answer was, I think, long, but, but the first thing he said stuck out in my mind, if I'm remembering correctly. When they asked him, is Jesus the only way of salvation, he said back, no one else is coming for you. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> is Jesus the only way? Well, no one else is coming for you. And so I want to explain to you why I think that's a brilliant answer. Because you have to understand if he's coming for you, he's coming for you in the midst of what? I think the problem with us as human beings is that we do not see the world the way that God sees it. And we do not think that our sin is a big deal, which makes sense. If there is a holy God, it makes sense that he would take sin more seriously than sinners do. So we don't see the world the way God sees it. We think sin is not a big deal. But sin invites judgment from a holy God. And sin invites judgment from a holy God. And meanwhile, we act like it's not a big deal, and we don't do it very often. And to be honest, there doesn't like, need to be a reaction to sin, you know, like a punishment. There doesn't need to be a reaction. It's just something I do occasionally, and there, nobody needs to do anything about it. And so we act like it's no big deal, and we live our lives, and we kind of act like heaven is the default setting for people. It's just where you automatically go, unless you are super, super bad. Isn't that true? Everyone just assumes. If you've been to a funeral, you know this. 
Everyone just assumes. I've done a lot of funerals. The, the default setting is heaven. Heaven is where you automatically go unless you're really bad. And because we assume that, the teaching that Jesus is the only way is offensive because we're seeing this thing as these people are going to heaven and then Jesus is sort of getting in the way, almost like stopping them from getting there. These people are naturally on their way to heaven and Jesus is sitting there going, no, 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 wait, 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 all these people. Did you, did you believe me? Did you believe in me on earth, right? Did you believe in me on earth? Where's your card? Where's your Christian card? Show everyone, give your Christian, you can't get in without a Christian card. And it's almost like these people are going to heaven and Jesus is stopping them from going where they would ordinarily go. Because that's what we believe, that the default is heaven. You don't have to be made right with God. Everyone is just automatically right with God, as long as you're not Hitler. That's the assumption. The assumption is you and I have not brought upon ourselves any sort of spiritual danger. And that's not true. This world is filled with sin that ought to be reacted to. This world is filled with violence and dishonesty and selfishness and greed and betrayal and bitterness. You know this to be true. You have eyes. It is real that our world is filled with those things. And you also know this quite uncomfortable truth. You have contributed to it. You have contributed to the sins of the world. I know for sure I have. When you think about the dishonesty and the selfishness and the greed in this world, there, there's no way you believe that you have contributed 0% of the problem. This world is filled with sin. You and I have contributed to it. And the Bible says there is a judgment for that. Our default is actually hell. And the good news of Jesus Christ is that in the midst of that, he came here. And he lived the life that you and I ought to have lived, a sinless life. And he died a punishment kind of death, not for his own sins, but on behalf of sinners. He died in our place and he came back to life, proving that everything he ever said was true. And he offers us forgiveness. He offers us a way to be right with God. He offers us a way to escape the judgment we are due. And it's for anyone who turns from their ways and turns to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That is good news. That that, that is available is good news. And what you need to know is you need to know that good news and you need to know no one else is coming for you. And if it's hard for you to picture that, if it's hard for you to picture spiritually sin, your sin, destroying you, and Jesus rescuing you from it, let me go ahead and give you an illustration that I hope will help you see this the right way. I want you to imagine that you are in a river. You're floating down the river. It's a river in North Carolina. And it's cold, but it's a real hot day, so it feels great. And you're floating in the river and having a good time. The depth of the river is just about as tall as you are, so you can stand on the bottom. But you're not standing on the bottom right now. Your feet are up and you're floating down the river, having a good time. And then something starts to happen slowly, and it starts so slowly that you do not notice it at first. But the current starts to get faster. And the water starts to rise a little bit. But it's kind of slow, and so you just kind of, it seems like I'm going faster. But, you know, you don't, you, don't know, you don't know what to do at first. But then it starts to compound. And the river really starts to get fast. And the water's really starting to rise. And you put your feet down, and you cannot touch the bottom anymore. And then, so now you're totally swimming. And now the river's current is so strong that you are not able to choose where you go in the river. And it keeps getting worse. And the current keeps getting faster, and the water keeps rising more, and you realize that the dam that's further up the river has opened up. Like a mile up the river, there's a dam, and that dam is opening up. And for this illustration to match reality, we also need to include 
that earlier in the day you were one of the people that opened up the dam. And I guess you forgot about it. And now you're in the river. And now you realize the consequences of the decision. And at this point, the water's moving so fast and it's so high. And you realize because of what has happened, you realize there are thousands and thousands and thousands of more gallons of water to come. And you are doomed. You are going to drown. You cannot outswim it. The situation is one that you cannot save for yourself. You're grabbing onto a rock, a rock that's going to be underwater in a few minutes. But you're hanging on for dear life as white water is just moving. It's like a white water rafting trip without the raft. And you're just hanging on to a rock as the water is coming higher and it's stronger. And, and all you know is like just doom is coming and you're just hanging on. And imagine you look to your right and there's someone there on the shoreline. And they say, I'm here to rescue you. And I want you to imagine that you look at that person in the eyes and you say, no, thank you. I believe in other rescuers. And imagine they say, okay, but you need to know this. No one else is coming for you. I'm telling you, in that moment, there is no way you're going to look at that guy and say, he's so mean and narrow and exclusive. Who's this guy think he is saying he, no one else is coming for me? No, you, in that moment, you're going to realize he is loving and honest. And that, I believe, is very similar to what Jesus has done for us, except that the judgment for our sin, according to the Bible, is more like fire than water. But sin is real, and judgment is real, and Jesus is the only person who can save us. So I want to end this sermon with an invitation. I want to talk to, I'm going to, I'm going to give an opportunity to those of you who are in maybe these categories. First of all, if you're someone here this morning and you are a first time like gospel understander, that this morning as I have given you the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, it has clicked for you and you understand Jesus is the savior that you need from your sins. And you, you need to do that. You need to be saved by Jesus. Or, if you are someone who would say, I've understood the gospel before this moment. Like, I, I, I've, I've understood it for a little while now, but God has been working in me these past several months. And even though what I'm hearing this morning isn't brand new information, I realize I'm on the fence. I realize God has been up to something, and I'm realizing I, I need to do something about it today. Or if you are someone here who says, I think God's been working on me lately. In fact, I think I believe in Jesus. I believe he's my savior and my only hope. And, and I, I've come to that realization fairly recently. And I haven't really told anybody yet. But I, I need to go public. I need to do whatever the next step is. And so if you are in any of those categories, you're understanding the good news of Jesus Christ for the first time, God has been working on you, and you are understanding in a way that you're going, I need to do something about this. Or if you're someone that's saying, I think I do believe in him and I need to take whatever the next step is. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. I want to encourage you to come up here, to like leave the chair that you're sitting in and come up forward here. And I was going to, my original plan that I ditched about 40 minutes ago was to just say after the service, come forward, and there will be people who have these uh, lanyards on. They're green lanyards, and they say counseling team. And you just come forward after the service and, and talk to the people that are here that are prepared to help you take the next step. And so that part's still going to be true. I'm going to just in a little bit, those of you who are on the counseling team, I'm going to ask you to come forward, and I'm going to ask those of you who are in those categories I just said to come forward and to talk with one of these people that they are, they are here and prepared to listen to you, to pray for you, to answer any questions you may have, and to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey. And, but instead of just doing it right after the service, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Lance and Kenan, will you guys come up? And that fourth song that you guys sang is exactly the words that should be sung after this sermon, which I didn't know until I sang it earlier. So let's go ahead and end with, you guys will sing that song. Those of you who are on the counseling team, I say 
you can come forward and just stand right up here in the front, even while the song is playing. Just sing along. And if you are someone who understands the gospel and you need to come to know Jesus, if you're someone that God's been working on you and you know, you, you know that this, it's not put it off a little longer time, or if you're someone that needs to go public in your faith, I want to encourage you to come forward either during this song or right after the service and take advantage of the people who will be standing up here who are willing to listen with you and pray with you and talk to you and answer any questions you have. So please take advantage of that. Are you hurting and broken with it? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream from the well? Jesus is calling. Who come to you, the order, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Who come to the order, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Who come to the order, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And oh, what a Savior is in you wonderful. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And oh, what a Savior is in you wonderful. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. And who come to the order, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ who come to the order the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ who oh, thank you Father Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Don't leave here this morning without becoming a follower of Jesus and or figuring out what the next step is for you. Let me end with these good words from God's word. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That is good news.